the rowing as an undergraduate, uh, I spent uh, actually probably more time on the river than, uh, than I did in the hospital. Uh, but that's uh, pretty inspiring stuff. Uh, how do you follow that? Uh, well, you follow that uh, with the, uh, uh, our guest lecture for endourology. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce to you uh, Professor Garney from the University of Michigan, where he's been on the faculty since 2013 and uh, leads their endourology program. Uh, but in many ways, it's, uh, it's not just uh, welcome to Kirsch, uh, it's welcome back. Uh, because uh, he's uh, a British trainee. He did his undergraduate uh, in Leeds, uh, then his basic surgical training uh, around the corner. I know the distance is up here a little bit larger than uh, for us in London, but in, uh, he was in Edinburgh. Uh, and then his uh, MS and surgical training in London, uh, St. George's and uh, with uh, Ken Anson at, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Ken Anson at St. George's and also at, uh, at Guy's. Uh, and already, uh, having walked around for the last uh, 15, 20 minutes with Kirsch, lots of uh, familiar and friendly faces uh, for him to catch up with. He's the author of uh, 130 papers um, and uh, has spent, uh, like I did, uh, a little bit of time coming up with some acronyms, uh, including dust uh, and music, and he'll tell us about music uh, in the second half of his lecture. Uh, compare and contrast uh, the guys that won that race uh, who came up with the brilliantly original and snappy name, uh, the Dutch Atlantic Four. Uh, they spent their time uh, practicing on the, uh, on the river uh, rather than coming up with uh, acronyms as we did, Kirsch. And amongst all of the rest of that, uh, he's uh, an editor and an associate editor of uh, various journals, uh, so definitely uh, a state-of-the-art lecture for us to enjoy. So Kirsch, uh, come and tell us about optimizing stone management uh, from laser settings uh, through population registries and quality improvement. Thank you. Thank you, Darren, and uh, good afternoon, and what a great honor for the invitation, Darren, and also Jonathan Glass, thank you very much. These are my relevant disclosures. Uh, I uh, am a consultant for two medical device companies. I have a research grant with Boston Scientific. A lot of the work I'll be speaking to you about is uh, from that. And then Michigan Urological Surgery Improvement Collaborative is a quality improvement consortium in the state of Michigan that's funded by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. So Darren is correct. I am a product of British urology, and it's a great honor for me to return here back to this uh, arena. I haven't been back to Bow since I left uh, to the US in 2011 and many of my trainers are in this room. I may have missed some of the people in this photo but I see Roger Kirby is here. I started my career in urology at the Western General with Alan McNeil and David Tolley. Then I did a, 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 a had a, a very important time with Ken Anson and Uday Patel at St. George's. But I'd just like to take a moment to pay tribute to one individual in particular and that is Mr. Andrew Ball at South End Hospital, who encouraged me to do a fellowship in the United States and supported me and was a great mentor to me and countless other urologists. And I'm sad that he's no longer with us and I wish he was here today. So in my talk, I'm going to divide this into two parts. The first section is around uh, how technical aspects around lasers and laser lithotripsy and in particular the dusting technique. And they are linked, and in the second part, I'm gonna talk about the quality of surgery, in particular outcomes, especially related to data in the state of Michigan. Urethroscopy in North America is now the number one operation for kidney stone treatment, and you can see from this graph from 1991 to 2010, it's overtaken shockwave lithotripsy, and approximately 60% of all surgical therapies for kidney stones in the states are with urethroscopy. It's more, my residents do more urethroscopies than TURP and TURBT combined. But when I trained, it was TURP that was the bread and butter of urology. It's different now, flexible urethroscopy. But we're not as good as we think. The results for urethroscopy, especially for kidney stone treatment, if you look really hard, are not that great. And if you look at CT-based follow-up, the complete stone-free rates for kidney stones approach only 65%. And it doesn't matter which technique you do, but dusting technique has become very popular. 
recently in the last decade. And when we did this survey in 2015 and surveyed worldwide endourologists, 60% of them said that they use low pulse energy and high frequency to break stones into powder. And it was surprising that 40% of them had access to high power systems. And it's these high power next generation homium systems that have been released that really led to a renewed interest in laser lithotripsy techniques. These surgeon specific settings, dual pedal features and very high frequencies that are allowing us now to improve, in my opinion, the quality, the technical quality of this operation. And there's a real great interest around dusting because there are some big advantages in the appropriately selected patient. Patients can avoid a ureteral access sheath, they can avoid a basket, and in some cases they can avoid a ureteral stent. And already the EDGE study from the United States has shown that if you dust, it's 50% the reduction in operating room time. And in the United States, operating room time is around $60 a minute. But there's really an important aspect around dusting technique, and that's quality of life. Avoiding a stent has significant implications for the patient. And it's in part two that I'll touch upon that. So before I delve into laser settings, I think we need to understand fundamentally what happens to a stone as you break it up with laser lithotripsy. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed. And what happens is a lot of the energy is ablating the stone. A fair amount of it is going into the fluid because there's fluid absorption and it's heating the fluid. A good proportion of it is leading to stone displacement and that's retropulsion. And a very small amount is energy transferred to light known as sonoluminescence. I want you to remember those four things as we go through and understand why we choose particular laser settings. When we do dusting technique, just as we heard from the previous talk regarding strategies on eat, sleep, I mean, there's a schema for everything in life. And so for us, there's a strategy and it starts with preoperative planning with a CT scan, stone uh, density, volume, location. And then we go on to two particular stages, contact laser lithotripsy followed by non-contact, otherwise popcorning. And the whole purpose of contact laser lithotripsy is to break the stone, debulk it in one entity, and then it ends up crumbling into a calyx where we popcorn. And popcorning is a really important technique if we're going to get stones broken down finely. So this is examples of contact laser lithotripsy using various settings in the kidney, breaking up the stone, interrogating it, brushing it, getting it smaller and smaller. And you can see that the results look pretty good, especially on the far right. You can see that most of the stone that's being ablated is powder. It is being uh, vaporized. But you can see in the middle screen that there's issues with vision. And I think vision is going to be a major issue as we go forward with the advanced lasers and dusting. And then, as I said, what will happen is it'll crumble into a calyx and then you intermittently fire the laser in bursts, breaking the stone systematically into smaller and smaller pieces. And whether you use a, a low watt setting, such as one joule and 20 hertz, or a high power setting, such as the other ones that you see on the screen, that is based on where, what access to lasers you have and what your philosophy is. So I'm going to take you through laser settings, and I'm just going to explain five basic parameters. And they all impact stone fragmentation, stone retropulsion, and laser fiber burnback. Three performance characteristics. So the first thing is pulse duration. Then I'm going to take you through pulse energy, pulse frequency. And now the newer pulse modulation on this particular machine, it's the MOSES technology, but more pu pulse modulation systems will be released in the next few years. And the final thing to discuss is total power. So this is a typical homium laser pulse. This is the anatomy of the pulse. You can see a sharp peak. It's known as a sh uh, shark's fin. And then you have a duration. It can vary from 200 microseconds to 1,200 microseconds. And then you have the area under the curve, which is the peak power, the maximum optical power of a pulse, which is defined as the pulse energy by the pulse duration. And the peak power is a very important concept because peak power is the difference between a long pulse duration and a short pulse duration. You can see the videos here. Look at the short pulse bubble. It's much bigger. It has a much, a much more profound impact. Look at the long pulse bubble. It's narrower, 
its impact on the fiber tip is much, much more gentle. And it's this peak power intensities between the two pulse that allow us to choose it for the appropriate reasons. And in particular, long pulse duration lasers provide lowest uh, retropulsion, as you can see in these high-speed imaging labs. And also, it is the most safest on the laser fiber tip. So long pulse duration leads to less retropulsion, lowest fiber burn back, and it's debatable whether it leads to the greatest dusting effect, but there's no data to say that, so I haven't been able to provide that to you on a slide. Pulse energy, and the, the relationship with pulse energy is very simple, as you can see in the, these videos. The higher the pulse energy, the more the ablation, but more retropulsion. And retropulsion, as we remember from that fundamental model, is wasted energy. But it's the low pulse energy that leads to the lowest retropulsion, the smallest ablation, but the lowest retropulsion. And it's the exploitation of the low pulse in the era of high frequency that allows us to do dusting technique. This is seminal work from Joel Teichman's group in Vancouver that showed that the lowest pulse energy, regardless of stone composition, lead to the smallest chip. And it's these small chips that you're aiming for when you do a dusting technique. Pulse frequency increases your fragmentation. So going from 5 hertz to 10 hertz, as demonstrated by Glenn Preminger in 1998, increased your fragmentation rate. In the modern day, 0.5 joules, when we go from 20 hertz to 60 hertz, it increases our fragmentation rate. So high hertz does increase your fragmentation, but the keen ones in the audience will see that the difference between 40 and 60 is not that profound. And that's because there's probably a saturation point where we're not going to see as much benefit from these super high frequencies. Nevertheless, at 50 hertz, 60 hertz, 70 and 80 hertz in the appropriately large stone, one can interrogate the stone with a contact phase procedure using maneuvers such as dancing, chipping, painting, to debulk the stone and to be systematic in getting it shrunk down. And I think the true, the, the, I think the, the, the big advantage about dusting is it allows us to start that way, but at the end, some of us may then proceed to retrieval, which is the hybrid approach that doctors, well, I should say, I'm, used, I'm in the US, so I'm always used to saying doctor, but Mr. Smith has coined the term dust menting. One thing to remember about these settings, it's very dynamic. So the stone starts off large, and as you break it down, you then have to change your settings. So in this case, if you see a wobble, you have to then reduce the hertz or you have to reduce the pulse energy. I want to move on to the next phase of laser lithotripsy, and that's popcorning. Non-contact laser lithotripsy, as described by Demetrius Bagley many years ago, because you're firing the laser off the fragments in a calyx, slowly, intermittently firing those pulses. And in the era of high frequency, high power systems, we were very interested in understanding what was the best laser setting. And so in this video of high speed imaging, we see some differences. And so number one, being close to the stone, as you see in the right sided video, leads to the greatest powder. So that leads to the greatest submillimeter fragmentation effect. So the closer you can get your laser fiber on the stone, it's not heating fluid unnecessarily, you get breaking up the stone. The second thing is high hertz, such as 80 hertz and high power settings are the best. The next thing is, in general, all of these high power settings lead to high powder and we will touch upon power shortly, but they give you the greatest submillimeter fragmentation. However, if you're doing popcorning in a large Kala seal model, such as you see here, no, no matter what settings you use, the results are not great. And that's why when we do popcorning, we select our calyx where we pulverize the stone. And we've been using a setting of 0 0.5 joules at 80 hertz, a 40 watt setting that we've been calling pop dusting. And we found both in the laboratory and in, in clinical practice, this breaks up the stone and leads to the finest fragments, as you can see in the video where it's working, and in that patient had a CT scan and they were completely stone free, but in the other patient it didn't work so well for various reasons, more dilated calyx, slightly harder stone, where we had to do a hybrid technique. 
The new technologies are pulse modulation, where you're getting a double bubble, uh, uh, where the, um, and I don't know if this video will play, but if, if, it, if I go back to that prior slide, um, go forward, what you see with the Moses uh, pulse modulation is you get a double bubble, and the, this second bubble, energy is tr being transmitted to the second bubble, and the first bubble is taking in the fluid because there's a certain amount of fluid absorption. So you're optimizing energy delivery. And what we found in the laboratory is that these um, uh, new pulse modulation mechanisms lead to more fragmentation. And in fact, we got around 30% more fragmentation when we broke a stone in a controlled laboratory environment. And if this video played, you'll see the differences in the double bubble in controlling retropulsion. And again, retropulsion is wasted energy. And if you can reduce retropulsion, you'll make yourself much more efficient. And another important aspect about um, pulse modulation, and I don't think these videos will play, but is that it works at distance. And so because of that two bubble phenomenon, you're able to deliver more energy, as you can see in that graph, to the stone at one millimeter away. And that's really important because how many of us are always touching the stone? We don't know during laser lithotripsy. It's an active process. So with pulse modulus me mechanisms, you're ablating the stone much more efficiently when you're away and also when you're on contact. And so these are some current knowledge gaps that we have in the field. We have this uh, tension between material absorption and fluid absorption. If we have great material absorption, we have too much dust and we have bad vision. And then we have to increase the flow rate. And that has safety consequences in terms of intrarenal pressure. And then in terms of fluid absorption, you've shown high power settings. What, was, what is that doing in terms of heat? And is that causing any damage to the kidney? And so on that, I'd like to transition to the last parameter, and that's total power. So we've gone from an era of fragmentation where we did eight and eight, 6.4 watts, to increasingly higher and higher energy. So, and in a study from our group showed that when you use 40 watt settings and you fired the laser for a long duration, you would get heat effects up to 70 degrees Celsius, and there can be thermal uh, damp toxicity to the renal tissue. So high power settings can generate heat, which can be injurious. And that's one take home message is that we do not advocate high power settings when we work in the ureter. We, we recommended low power settings and the technique is slightly different. We work centrally versus peripherally for obvious reasons. But with great power comes great responsibility. And the current strategies that you have to consider when using high power in the kidney are you have to regulate your laser burst, what's called the operator duty cycle. You have to use higher flow rates as we've seen. We can use ureteral access sheets to improve outflow drainage. We can use chilled irrigant. I think some of you might be using warmed irrigant and in the era of high power settings, maybe that has to be, you have to reconsider that approach. There can be active suction and Overall, we can do other strategies to improve the efficiency of, uh, of laser fragmentation. And so we are going to move towards an automated future in this field. We've done work on understanding visual detection of stone composition using uh, visual uh, recognition features. And I think digital endoscopes will speak to the laser platform it will work out the stone composition. It will optimally give you the setting automatically. And we will have automated systems that will put irrigation and suction and control both the temperature and the intrarenal pressure. This is inevitably the future of where laser lithotripsy is going. So in summary, dusting technique offers the option of stentless ureteroscopy. Long pulse reduces retropulsion and limits fiber tip degradation. Low pulse energy results in the lowest retropulsion and fragment size. Higher frequencies lead to more fragmentation. Keeping the fiber on contact with the stone results in the greatest fragmentation. New advances such as pulse modulation improves fragmentation, especially at distance. And for popcorning, high power settings result in the highest powder. However, high power settings may lead to heat generation, which needs to be mitigated. 
So on the second part, I'd like to talk about stents and ureteroscopy in the kidney and what impact they're having on a population level. I explained to you, ureteroscopy is the number one operation. In the United States, we spend more money treating kidney stones than we do prostate cancer. And one of the things that the UDA group based in Mark Littman and Chuck Scales recently looked at is the cost for ureteroscopy and shockwave lithotripsy. And they found that one in six patients visited the emergency department within 30 days after a simple ambulatory procedure like ureteroscopy. And they concluded that interventions are needed to identify and reduce preventable unplanned visits. We looked at this in the state of Michigan. My colleague John Hollingsworth looked at payments for ureteroscopy, and we found that the average payment was around $11,000, but there's a wide variation in payments de depending on the hospital. And what we found is that if you had a ureteroscopy using claims data, and then you had a, an unplanned visit to the emergency department, costs went up by 50%. If you were hospitalized, costs went up by another 100%. And these unplanned encounters are costly. They're costly to the payer, and they're also troublesome for the patient. So in the state of Michigan, we have a statewide collaborative. We have around 45 practices that all share data, look at best practices. The whole point is to understand areas of performance, look at exemplary performance, and see what strategies can then be implemented throughout the state to improve care at a population level. And it's been that around since 2011, it started as a prostate cancer initiative led by my colleagues David Miller and Jim Monty, but we've now expanded it into kidney stone care. And we've developed a collaborative called Reducing Operative Complications from Kidney Stones, and another acronym, as Darren uh, kindly said. And our vision is to make Michigan the safest place in the world for kidney stone care. Our initial goal has been to reduce these unplanned encounters after ureteroscopy. So how do we do this? It's not simple just to collect data. We have to collect the data to improve. So this is a, a schematic of our architecture. Every practice has a trained abstractor. We pay the practices to put standardized, high-quality, audited data into a prospective clinical registry. We have a champion in every practice whose job is to be the boots on the ground, get the troops going to improve care and, and bring in the processes into that practice. We have patient advocates that tell us what matters to them and what we should focus on in terms of kidney stone care. And we try and choose these projects based on patient advice, member advice. We meet three times a year where we go through all the projects, look at the data, and then develop implementations. And so our, our philosophy is to use the data to inform action that then goes back to making feasible change in the practice real-world practice. So this is a snapshot of what's happening right now in the state of Michigan amongst all these practices doing ureteroscopy. You can see 36% access sheath use, 57% are doing retrieval, 72% are doing overall stenting rate, and you can see that the stone clearance rates, like I said before, 61% for kidney stones, but much higher, obviously, for ureteral stones at 94%. And this is what's happening in the state when we look at 21 practices, when we last looked at this data, nearly 7,000 ureteroscopies in our registry. We now have 15,000, but at this stage, I just want to present this data. And you can see the variation in outcomes. Why is practice one got a zero ED visit rate? And why does practice 21 have the highest rate at nearly 16%? What is practice on the far left doing that we can learn from so that the practices on the far right can adopt? And we found that a lot of these visits are occurring in the first seven days. And this is the reasons for the visit. And most of the visits, around 40% are related to pain, hematuria, urinary symptoms, stent-related symptoms mostly, but 70% of these patients had stents. And we found that uh, on multivariable analysis, the use of a ureteral stent was highly significantly associated with an emergency department visit. And if we look at our data over the last few years, these modifiable rates of these visits for pain and hematuria are stable. They're around 30 to 40%. So these patients will present to the emergency room. They'll be fully evaluated. They'll get a CT scan. They'll get labs. They'll get all sorts of things, and they'll go home. And it's the stent, or it's just symptoms related to the surgery. 
So what can we do to modify that and to reduce these unplanned encounters? Well, this is a schematic that gives us an overview of what we can target. We can educate patients better about what stents mean and what, what to expect with stents. We, we can avoid stents in the first place, and that's why I pivot back to the part one where dusting technique offers that opportunity in the select patients. And we can do much more in terms of understanding their quality of life and other aspects regards to improving symptom control with better medication. So the first thing we've done is we've developed a very stent-specific patient education leaflet with our advocates, with our members. It's available on our website. Anyone can use it. And we've been in, inputting that in all the practices and it's been a big part of the drive just to set expectations. There was one study from Switzerland recently that showed that patients who were better informed had less uh, symptoms. The second thing is we've developed guidance on improving symptom control. In the US, it's been very common to put a lot of these patients on opiate medication. And what we've pivoted towards is non-steroidals, uh, alpha blockers based on guideline-based care, and also ant, uh, anticholinergics for those who have a stent. And we've also created patient education leaflets around this so patients understand why they're getting these medications and that they don't need opiates, but there are better targeted drugs that will improve their symptoms after this operation because this operation has symptoms. And the last thing that we've done is we've instituted performance feedback. Practices get aggregate data on how their emergency department visit rate is doing. Physicians, I get a quarterly report of my performance, how many urethroscopies I've done, what my stone-free rate is, what my emergency department visit is, what my imaging rate is, what my use of alpha blockers is, what my, you name it. It's fascinating for me. And I, we can go back and look back at why our patients got sick. And we rely a lot on physicians and their own inner, inner drive to do better. But we do have to also develop strategies around the whole wide state to drive improvement in care. And I'm not saying that we've won, and I'm not saying we've winning, but this is just an assessment of the last couple of years of those emergency department visit rates. We've seen a somewhat of a reduction. I don't know if it's just we're collecting more data, and I don't know if it's just the Hawthorne effect of everyone now knowing that this is a drive to improve care, that we have a mission around this. But we are seeing some signs of an early success, although wouldn't not, you know, we, we have to give it a little bit more time. But I would say that we are very focused on two future strategies, is that one of the things that we're going to look at, and if you look at that graph, you can see this is our pilot group when we started ROCKS. One practice is doing 40% stenting, and on the far right, around 100%. So why does one practice stent less and the other one stent more? And so we're developing appropriate use criteria for urethral stenting after urethroscopy in the state. That's a, a big initiative that we have planned. And we're also going to be developing a patient-reported outcome system to better understand quality of life and the patient's perspective. So I go back to this. Dusting technique has major advantages in the appropriately selected patient, and that is to reduce the use of routine stents. And as you've seen from our work in the state of Michigan, Urethroscopy and stents in particular have significant healthcare economic implications. So, in summary, the emergency department visit rate is an emerging quality indicator for urethroscopy and laser lithotripsy. Overall, in the state of Michigan, we found that one in 10 patients visit the emergency department within 30 days, but variation exists in outcomes. Nearly 40% of these visits are due to pain and stent related symptoms, and they're potentially modifiable. But measurement is not enough. In music, we've been collecting the data, providing outcomes, understanding best practices, and designing interventions to improve the quality of stone surgery. Initially, our initial quality improvement efforts are to educate patients on what to expect and better symptom management. And we hope that this will have an impact in reducing emergency visits in the state. It's a huge effort, just as you saw from the tough lecture, that it's a team approach, and I'm just a messenger for our group. So many hardworking people that I represent. I take, in, in, you know, I, I want to acknowledge everybody in the picture here, David Miller, Jim Monty, my colleagues in ROCKS, Casey Dow, John Hollingsworth, and of course our patient advocates. 
I also need to acknowledge our laser lithotripsy team at uh, Michigan for the work that I presented, uh, which is a multidisciplinary group between urology, uh, engineering, and chemistry. And I also say that we have a course that we run every year in Chicago, and I, I, and I said to Darren that we are going to give free registration to any BAUS members who register using the code BAUS, but there's only 10 free spots, so the first 10 free. So, so please, you know, if you're interested in understanding more about laser lithotripsy, come to our meeting in August. And finally, a plug for this meeting in, at the AUA in December, which is a, a collaboration to, between the AUA and Endo Urology Society, where we're going to be discussing uh, outside-the-box uh, ideas for improving kidney stone care. And so on that note, I, I, I thank you very much for your attention and the opportunities to speak. Thank you. Well, Kesh, thank you very much for that tour de force. We started marginally late, uh, but that was a, a brilliantly delivered and perfectly timed lecture uh, to, uh, to take up that half-hour slot. So we won't have time for questions now because there's something else on the programme. Uh, but as you would rightly expect, for uh, 10 free places at uh, Kirsch's meeting, we're getting our money's worth out of him here. He'll be around all week. Uh, he'll be chairing one of the stone sessions tomorrow, uh, doing the stone course. Uh, so uh, if you want to catch up with him, ask him anything, uh, or coin your own uh, partial acronym, like uh, maybe uh, paint dusting uh, or uh, dust popping, that's possibly even illegal, uh, catch up with him in the next 48 hours and have a chat with him. Kirsch, thank you very much. Thank that was you. excellent.